So we'll start with uh, what we do know, and that's Jackson Darts in the transfer portal. Now, where he's going to land is um, anybody's guess, but there's a number of destinations that make sense. And one is obviously tied to Graham Harrell's move from USC to West Virginia. Absolutely. And these moves came within a very short period of time. You know, the, the two moves were not separated by a whole lot of time on Monday afternoon, late morning in Los Angeles. So that particular detail would lend a lot of credence to the notion that Jackson Dart is going to follow Graham Harrell. And, you know, when Jackson Dart got the chance to play, you know, he certainly showed his stuff against Washington State in September, and then at the end of the season in a very good game against BYU. Now, most people weren't paying attention to it because USC was so bad, and, you know, Bedlam had just ended, uh, and ironically, the game that because o Oklahoma lost, that opened the door for Lincoln Riley uh, to go to USC because he didn't have to coach the Big 12 championship game. But anyway, Jackson Dart played really well against BYU, and so, you know, his stock as a, as a transfer portal quarterback is considerable. And the fact that Graham Harrell, you know, boosted that stock, uh, it certainly lends a lot of credence to the notion that he's going to go to West Virginia. So, like, we, we don't know for sure, but, like, I would I would say West Virginia has to be the favorite at this point. And it brings up a fascinating scenario. Uh, so, for your listeners, if you're not already aware, West Virginia and Pitt are bringing back the backyard brawl in 2022, and it's in week one. And guess who's the quarterback for Pitt? Keaton Slovis, Jackson Dart's former USC teammate. So you could have former USC quarterbacks going up against each other in week one in a big rivalry game with Graham Harrell being the coordinator on one side of that rivalry. That would be an absolutely amazing week one storyline. It would certainly spice up what is an always spicy backyard brawl whenever West Virginia and Pitt do manage to play each other in the same season. I, I, that would be great. That would be so great to see happen. It would be phenomenal. It's people. It's a, a, a matchup that people in that part of the country, as you allude to, are already at a fever pitch about because they used to play every year and typically near the end of the season. Of course, the 2007 uh, result when Pitt knocked uh, West Virginia out of the national championship race with a 13 to nine win is historic, but because of moving to different conferences, they've not played for roughly a decade, something in that range. So now they're going to get back together. And then we bring in the possible West coast storyline with Keaton Slovis for sure on the Pitt side and possibly um, Graham Harrell for sure. And now possibly Jackson Dart, playing on the um, West Virginia side in place of Jared Deggy, who's moving on in the transfer portal as well. Um, you know, speaking of the transfer portal, um, I was a bit interested in the Jaden Delora move from Washington state to Arizona, considering we're looking at the offensive player, freshman offensive player of the year in the PAC 12, who seemed to uh, be a, a candidate for a number of, better destinations from a football standpoint, at least that uh, he's going to Arizona and Jed fish. Yeah. So, you know, Jed fish, he's certainly established a reputation as someone who can deliver the players, you know, in terms of recruiting, in terms of the transfer portal, like he has made a significant impact. I mean, he's flipped some Oregon commits, turned them to Tucson. I mean, that that's pretty impressive in its own right. And now this convincing Jaden Delora to go from Washington State, which, you know, let's keep in mind, Washington State almost won the Pac-12 North. Like, Washington State already has contender status in the Pac-12 under Jake Dicker, a coach who, you know, did a very good job as the interim taking over from Nick Rolovich last season. One would think that that's a pretty good situation. So for Jed Fish to be able to convince Delora to come down to Tucson, I mean, it, it, it certainly has that Mac Brown, you know, sell snow to Eskimos type feel to it. But now, of course, the question with Jed Fish is, can he coach him up on game day? That's that's obviously the lingering question. But uh, just to kind of stick with this uh, Dolores situation a little bit, I can't help but wonder if the Sun Bowl, you know, when Washington State lost to Central Michigan, Delora got benched midway through that game and it was the, his backup who led a Washington State rally in the second half. It fell short, but Washington State at least did something on offense in the second half without Delora on the field. 
did that benching represent uh, the moment when Delora mentally said, you know, Washington State's not the program for me? Uh, it, it seems as though the sun set on his uh, desire to stay in Pullman uh, in that Sun Bowl game. Matt, this is just one of many reasons why we have you on. I checked out at 21 nothing Central Michigan, so I didn't even know Delora got benched. And yeah, they made it a game at 24-21 against Central Michigan in the Sun Bowl. I watched the Washington State Central Michigan games of the world so that you don't have to. <laughs> There we go. I'm usually that guy, Matt, but you even take it to another degree. <laughs> well, so. but like we, we've just been through a season where you and I have had these conversations where, you know, like I have to be the guy watching those dumpy <laughs> USC games because you were focused on Michigan, Ohio State and, you know, the important thing. So like that's the division of labor around here. I, I, I have to scrounge around. You focus on the elite games as you should as the voice of college football. I got the Pac-12 locked down here. I really never thought we would get to a point, even in that five and seven USC season in 2018, we would get to a point where USC pretty much in, in my dealings with the viewers and fans every day, pretty much slept walk through a season that nobody noticed. No, yeah, it's the most uneventful season ever. And, and we, and we had this particular conversation too, that, you know, USC won only one game in 1957, won only two games in the early 19 in a, in a season in the early 1950s uh went three and nine under larry smith or three and eight i should say under larry smith uh, circa 1991 I, or 1992 one of those years and yet you know those seasons were still competitive but this was a year in which usc regularly got blasted and games were over five minutes into the third quarter it really was the most uneventful season for a high profile program that i can ever remember just so few games were dramatic you know at least nebraska as a point of contrast, lost a lot of games, but always competitive. But USC lost a lot of games and was rarely, if ever, competitive. It was it was the most unusual season, but we sure got the payoff in the coaching carousel and Lincoln Riley. Like so, USC fans, it was a very easy way to forget about everything that transpired from September through Thanksgiving Day, and then Thanksgiving weekend brought manna from heaven with Lincoln Riley.